Are you wanting to debate me on something? On the Trinity. Would you debate me on the Trinity? Do you deny the Trinity? Yes. I'll debate you. All right. All right. Okay. Do you just want to... Who, now here's what. Do you want to have a moderator for the? Do minutes? you want a moderator? Do you want sure. it timed? Yeah. How many minutes each? Uh, five. Five, five minutes, minutes each. Five minutes. Can I suggest three? I do a lot of debates here. I know it's better to do three. Three minutes is not. Meet me halfway. I'm giving you more time. Okay, how about four then? No, three. All it's right. Okay. More than two thirty, so it's more than halfway. Yeah. Could someone please time us? We're doing three minutes. Three minutes. Now, right, would you like to go first? Or do you want me to go first? I'm being very hospitable to you. I'll go first. You'd like to go first? Yeah. Okay, so we're doing three minutes, three minutes. The debate is the Trinity. What I suggest, brother, is that you direct your conversation to the people that are listening while responding to me and I'll do vice versa. Okay. Because if, if we talk to one another, we'll start speaking quietly and people won't be able to hear All us. Right. Okay. So. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why I do that in debates. Okay. So, over to you, brother. Ready? Wait, when, when he says he's ready, when he says he's ready. Are you ready, bro? I want to start out by saying that the New Testament is based upon the Old Testament on the foundation. It's based upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets of old. And uh, the revelation, furthermore, of God was given first to the Jews. All right? And they have a very important, uh, you could say, doctrine or, yeah, the uh, doctrine, let's say that uh, kind of unites the Jewish people as a people even up until this day, and that is called the Shema. The Shema says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So when the, when the Israelites were tempted to go after the other gods who had, who had God, multiple gods, God would send his prophets to these people. And basically what they would say was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, contrary to the gods of the nations that had surrounded Israel, is one divine being, <coughs> one Lord. And that's the revelation, see, of, of the, 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 like I say, the Jews, the Jews had the divine revelation. They were first given the true revelation of the God of, of, of creation. And simply, Christianity was infiltrated by a pagan concept, concept uh, of God by the anti-Nicene church fathers, which basically all had a, a Greek background. And, and like Plato, he said, uh, there's nothing in nature that uh, we can know God, by which we can know God. Yes, I mean, nothing in nature, this three, the pagan God is like a three, three-headed monster like the sign over, over there has a body and then three heads that's uh, nothing in nature directly contrary to the uh, to the words the teaching of the Apostle Paul who, who said that uh, for the invisible things of God can be clearly understood by that which we he, he has created so I say the Trinitarian uh, they are without excuse and that Paul says that also so that they are without excuse it's clearly seen. God, uh, so if we want to study God, what, how do we, what, what, what do we do? We study that which is... 30 seconds, sir. Okay, I'll pick up on when I... Come no, back. 30 seconds. Oh, 30 seconds. Oh, when, when, when we want to study God, then we should study that which is uh, cl created closest to God, even in the very image. And what is that? Man. I would, we would be a fool, a fool. Man is made up of spirit, soul, and body. That's exactly what... What God, the creator of heaven and earth, is he spirit, he's, he, he, what, I could say, I mean, uh, in li my limit, our limited language to define God. Time. Okay. All right, Thank so you. three minutes. Ready. So, ladies and gentlemen, he jumped to Romans 1 and he said, the man is without excuse because in nature he can learn about God. 
That's what he said. Now, just to put that in context, that was not about Trinity or not Trinity. That was talking about the moral law. However, there is some truth to what the brother says. We can look at nature and we can learn about God. Can three be one and one be three? Yes, you're all stood in three-dimensional space right now. Uh, the triple point of water or of any chemical substance where water takes on at certain pressures and temperatures the properties of gas, liquid and solid all at the same time shows us that it is possible to have plurality and singularity in the same space at the same time, ladies and gentlemen. So there is some truth that we can learn from nature. And indeed, he's right to look at man because he quoted the Shema. And what does the Shema say? It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. How many of you know that the word one there in that verse is the word in Hebrew, ekad? Ekad is a plural singular. Let me give you an example of it. In Genesis chapter 1, it says, Because she was taken out of man, in verse 24, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife and they shall become Ekad. one flesh. Ekad flesh, one. So that's two persons that are one. So here we understand in scripture very clearly that the scripture points towards nature and man as the brother has tried to make the argument and that nature and man points to the idea that the idea of God being a plural singular, a plural in one sense and a singular in another sense, makes sense of scripture. I'm going to end my first three minutes by reading this. Listen to me, O, jo o Jacob and even Israel whom I called. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. Surely my hand founded the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand together. Assemble all of you and listen. Whom among them has declared these things? Who's speaking here? God is speaking. And it goes on. The Lord loves him. He will carry out his good pleasure on Babylon. That's a reference to Cyrus. And his arm will be against the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken. Indeed, I have called him. Who's that? God. I have brought him and he will make his way successful. Come, and I'll finish that in my next three minutes. All right. I, I would just like to quote, stop, stop, actually stop. quote the scripture. Yes, yeah, stop. From his first word. I would just like to quote the scripture here in Romans chapter 1, <laughs> verse 19 and 20. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Look at that. Man being made in the image of God. And I would be a fool to make a, make a person out of my own spirit. That's what the Trinitarians have done. Okay, so it goes on and says, For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him, the God which we're talking about, whether he's made up of these three persons or not for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world man is certainly part of the creation of the world okay are clearly seen being understood by the things that he hath made and certainly man was made of god all right even to the extent we can understand even some of the uh, you know the eternal power and godhead which that's what we're talking about even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The Trinitarians, according to the word of God, are, without, are left without excuse for their foolish doctrine. So again, I just want to repeat myself. If we want to know God, in as far as we can know him, at least, then study man. Man who is made in the very image of God. So when we, when we do that, we find that man is a three-partite creature made up of spirit, one, soul, two, body, three. That's also when we study God as well as, you know, uh, looking at man, if we study the, the, the scriptures, we see that God 
is, uh, uh, you know, the Bible in one place talks about body. Moses saw the hinder parts of God. And uh, we study God sometimes says, my spirit, notice my spirit. And I'd like to ask this dear brother, if uh, when God says my spirit, if that's not the Holy Spirit, yes. That's a power that emanates out from the very being of God. Furthermore, not to get in a rabbit hole here, but in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, God himself says, and grieve not the Holy, or the word of God says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. So God has a spirit. He can be grieved in his spirit, same as a very, as a, as a uh, man, mature Christian, can also be grieved in his spirit, just like God can be grieved in his, in his spirit. God also says, my spirit. When God looked in Genesis, we find when God looked down and saw all the corruption in the earth, he says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. So there we, again, it's a confirmation that the Holy Spirit, time. God is holy. Time, so, time. Okay. Right, ladies and gentlemen, let's just be clear. He didn't take on board what I said. I, I, I agree we learn about God through nature, so pointing out what Christians believe doesn't help make your case. And I pointed out that nature does demonstrate that you can have singularity and plurality together. And that the oneness of God is like the oneness of marriage. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The word one is a card. That man should leave his mother and father and be joined unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Why flesh? Because that's the substance of man. Why too? Because that's the person of man and woman. And so you see from nature that God can be multipersonal whilst having a singular essence. And just to point out that Romans is talking about the moral argument, he's making a moral law. It says in verse 16, says in verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, sorry, 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from the heaven against all ungodliness. Paul is making a moral argument about what we can know about God. He's not making an ontological argument in the sense of whether God is Trinity or not Trinity. The brother is going from the wrong starting point. How are we doing for time? No. You all heard me read the, the verse in Isaiah 48. Who remembers that the one that was speaking was the one that laid the foundations of the world? Put your hand up. Was the one that stretched out the heavens? Put your hand up. Who agrees with me that that has to be God? But then listen to what it goes on to say. From the first I have not spoken in secret. From the time it took place, I was there. And now Yahweh God has sent me and his spirit. How is the creator, the layer of the foundations of the earth and the stretcher out of the heavens being sent by Yahweh? How is God sending God? Does he perhaps believe it's referencing two gods? Or maybe he could adopt Trinitarian theology, which is that the Father is sending the Son with his Spirit. And to answer his question, yes, when it says my Spirit in Scripture, we believe that that is the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Holy Spirit is a Spirit that proceeds from the Father and is referenced from the Father as being my Spirit. But that Spirit is a person, and I'll demonstrate that next. I do not find it necessary, necessarily, to address, and you have to forgive me when I say this, okay, the lies that he's promoting. <laughs> okay, I say that out of all due respect. All I ask is you don't touch. Say whatever you like, but keep your hands to yourself. Now, but, uh, see, when, when he talks about a compound unity, like a family, it takes three to make a family. Now, any way you look at, it, look at it, one, ekad, one, is one. So they're approaching this, uh, they're, they're, they already have established their, this preconceived idea 
that they have, and then they apply that to God. It's you know as though God would be made up of a of a this compound unity. That's not what the prophets of Israel meant. They had no idea that to say that God is is a compound unity like uh, like the Trinitarians. But the Scripture is just all uh, full of uh, confirmations that back you know that back the, my my. Uh, the, the way I see God as one. Uh, for example, Jesus said, this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, one God, and Jesus Christ. So here we see two persons, two persons. Jesus stands between the one creator God and men, one mediator between God and men. So there's a confirmation. And then the other confirmation, many, many, I'm just giving a few here. Uh, Paul the Apostle talks about the headship. So God is the head of Christ, and Christ is the head of man, and man is the head of woman. The headship order. If the Holy Spirit would be a distinct person as they claim, then where does the Holy Spirit as a distinct being or person come in this headship order? The Bible, the Word of God is silent. Just another confirmation. And then uh, you know, the, the Bible in Genesis. Who is the creator? God is the creator. How does he create? create? By his power. So we, who are understand God, we maintain that the Holy Spirit is a power that emanates out from the being of God. That's why Jesus told, said, wait, uh, wait in, uh, I think, wait in Jerusalem till you be endued with power. The Holy Spirit then is poured out upon all flesh and empowers them to live a holy, righteous, godly life. It's an indwelling power that abides in us. In the Old Testament, this power came upon men. This person, in other words, is not foolish. A Time. Person. Time. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's be clear. Did you notice he didn't address my point at all in Isaiah? The creator of the world was sent by God with the Spirit of God. How does that even work? Because God is Trinity, not singular. But now we're going to lay down the hammer on this guy. Because all he seems to have is ad hominem. Calls me a liar. But he doesn't address my arguments. Now the moment your opponent starts doing ad hominem, rather than addressing your arguments, you know he's out of his depths. I want to invite the brother to go back to the shallow pa'ul of theology if the deep waters are something that he's going to start drowning in, ladies and gentlemen. Now, in Acts 1.16, it says this, that the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand. It says in Acts 1.16, brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas. In Acts 28, 25, we read this. Let's go on. Acts 28, 25 says the following. It says, ladies and gentlemen, and when they did not agree, sorry, and when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah. The Holy Spirit is described scripturally as speaking. Do persons speak or do powers speak? Jesus Christ himself described the Holy Spirit as another advocate in John 14, 15 and 16. Well, what's an advocate? An advocate is the one who stands between party A and party B, arguing a defense, giving a reason, speaking on their behalf. That's an advocate. That's a person. He already alluded that the Holy Spirit could be grieved. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. If you can be grieved, you're a person. In Romans, Paul says that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. What's an intercessor? An intercessor is one who prays or speaks on your behalf between party A and party B. 
These are the descriptions of a person, none of which fits in with this childish, fundamentalist, <laughs> ignorant of scripture, shallow theology. I want him to answer my points, not just accuse me of lying. Saying that I don't have to is not an excuse. It means you're losing the debate. Thank you for your kind words. <laughs> The, the, you, the, From very the, thi the very thing that he accused me of, he does likewise. He did not address my, uh, what I brought out. And, and when he quoted the, uh, Ephesians 4, 4 and verse uh, 30, it says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Why? Again, exactly as I said in the beginning, because God's, God's being is also, if I dare to say that in human words, trying to explain God, but I'll say it, constituted by these three, spirit, soul, and body. And we would be a fool to make a, I, I have a spirit, I would be a fool to make a, to make a distinction, say my spirit is a person as distinct from myself, which is what the, the man here is doing. See? And so he has not addressed uh, my, uh, what I brought out. Let's just let the, uh, the Holy Spirit go a little bit. Let's go to Jesus. They say, they say that Jesus is part of God. I write on my sign over there, I say that Jesus is one in spirit with God the Father, not one in being, as he as a Trinitarian claims. That's ludicrous to claim that, that I could be one in, in being with my wife. We're one in flesh same as Jesus was one in spirit with God the Father, but not one in being. So furthermore, to clarify, to help you see, the, see what's going on here, Jesus prayed that they might be one as I and my Father are one. There again, there's proof that Jesus did not claim to be one in being, but one in purpose, one in spirit, one in purpose with God the Father through the Holy Spirit, through the power that emanates out from God. So if Jesus would have been one in, Jesus, it would have, the prayer of Jesus would have been ludicrous to pray that we can be one in being with God as these people claim. Use your minds, my dear people. Use your rationality. That's what God has given us. The Bible says, come let us reason together. This brother, if we will, brother, I don't know, but I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, okay? Uh, the, the final, the final uh, cards that he has is, oh, it's a mystery. That's their card, the, the car, final card. That that's uh, they would, they will say it's a great mystery. If God would be, if we could understand God, then God would not be God. That's their final card, trump card that they use to. Uh, we just have to accept it, even though we can't understand it with our mind. That's what these uh, brother. These people end give me until saying. six. No, Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only, Time. only Good. true God. Notice. Time. Right, ladies and gentlemen. He accuses me of not answering his point. But if you remember at the beginning of this debate, he made an argument from Romans, which I addressed, and the argument from human nature, which I addressed, and the argument from the Shema, which I addressed. And then I gave him a counter argument, which he did not address, and he has not addressed any point that I've made since then. However, to demonstrate what addressing your opponents look like, let me address again the point that he made about humans, the argument about Trinity being based on the analogy of body, soul and spirit. He's attacking a straw man. Did any of you ever hear me in this debate make such an argument? He's attacking an argument I haven't made, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. So why should I address it further? Let him address my arguments, not the ones that he wants to attack. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's be clear. We have demonstrated that the Holy Spirit is an advocate, is an intercessor, is someone who speaks, is someone who gives gifts as it does, as he's described in scripture. In Acts 20, in Acts 21, sorry, in Acts 20 it reads this. In verse uh, 22, 
Bear with me. Right. In verse 22 and 23. And now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city. So the Holy Spirit bears witness. How is he an advocate, an intercessor, and a witness, and not be a person, ladies and gentlemen? In verse 28 of the same passage it says, Be on your guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The Holy Spirit is making decisions for the church. How is that not a person? That's the reason why our heretic, and that is what he is, we're not brothers in the new covenant, that is why our heretic wants to suddenly drop the conversation about the Holy Spirit because he has no answers, ladies and gentlemen. And I am so confident he has no answers that I am going to give over the remaining of my time so he has extra time to deal with the question of how the Holy Spirit is an intercessor, an advocate, a witness, and a decision maker who gives gifts. Five things. That's still a gift. <laughs> Jesus tells us when he walked on this earth, he says that men can speak a word against the Son of Man and that sin can be forgiven. But those who speak against the Holy Ghost will, cannot be forgiven in this life nor in the world to come. Does that mean that the, the Holy Spirit is greater, a greater person, as he says he's a person, than Jesus Christ himself or even God himself maybe? No, let me give you the proper understanding of that. See, the Holy Spirit is the power that illuminates us. Is it a power? It's a power that emanates out from from Almighty God. It's the. It's actually Jesus said. Uh, said oh, in, in John, it talks about uh, that light, which lighteth every man that comes into the world. That's a power that emanates out from the being of God that gives light to the inner man, to our to our being. What Jesus was saying, if we, not that the Holy Spirit is a person greater than Jesus, that's on the surface what it would appear to, to be. If the Holy Spirit is a person, if we, and if we sin against that person, and that sin cannot be forgiven, but yet if we sin against Jesus as a son of man, that sin can be forgiven, then that would automatically leave the implication that the Holy Spirit is a greater person than Jesus Christ himself. But no, that's not the case. The Holy Spirit is a power that emanates out from the being of God. And right now, I, I just exhort you, all my, my dear fellow citizens, don't sin against the light of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is an, a powerful influence convicting you of sin. It's not a person, it's easy to understand. Easy to understand. The Holy Spirit is the light which lighteth every man that comes into the world. In the Old Testament, now I'm going into my preaching mode. In the Old Testament, All 45 the, seconds the Holy it. Spirit would come over the prophets. And then they would do miraculous things like prophesy. Samson, when the Holy Spirit would come upon him, he would be a mighty, he would be like a, a backhoe with a boom, wham, wham, and kill a thousand seconds. people with the, the jawbone of a donkey. The Holy Spirit now in the New Testament comes and abides in men. It's not a person, be real. Not, it's the power, it, power of God that seals us. We are sealed, not with a person again, my dear friend. It's, not, it's, a, it's a influence, a powerful influence that remains in us, transforms us into the image of the Lord Jesus. That's what the promise was. You shall receive power Time. after Time. that the Holy Spirit comes Time. upon you. Time. Hallelujah. Ready? 
So, ladies and gentlemen, I, even with my generous extra five seconds, he didn't once address any of the points that I made. And so what I, I'm going to do one more round with him and then I'm going to do conclusions. Because if my interlocutor is not actually going to engage with what I'm saying, then there's no point continuing the conversation. I made the argument based on six points, several, several points. Argument number one. That nature points to a plural unity within the divinity. Argument number two, the Shema does not deny the Trinity. Argument number three, that Isaiah points to God being sent by God, which makes no sense unless you believe in the Trinity. The Creator being sent by Yahweh makes sense if you believe the Trinity, because we believe that the Word of God was by which the Father created the world. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was in the beginning with God and was God, and through Him all things were made. That's talking about Jesus Christ in verse 18. Then I went on to demonstrate that the Holy Spirit is a person. He is an advocate. He is an intercessor. He is a witness. He is a decision maker. He can be grieved. He is someone who speaks. These are all attributes of a person. And even with a generous extra five seconds, he didn't even deign himself to try and address one of those points. And do you know why, ladies and gentlemen? Why? Because this is what happens when you pick up a Bible and decide that you can just do it yourself. This is why when you pick up the Bible, you should interpret it in the line of 2,000 years of Christian tradition and teaching. It is a danger to your soul to pick up your Bible and decide that you are the highest authority. And that, unfortunately, is how the devil has trapped this brother in sin and has put his soul in peril because of his pride in himself and in his ignorance of Christian faith, in his ignorance of Scripture. A man who can't even bring himself to address the six points about the Holy Spirit and didn't want to address the passage in Isaiah and just said, I'm not going to address Isaiah because you're a liar and I don't want to address your arguments about the Holy Spirit. Let's move on to talking about Jesus. But Jesus himself says, that he is God and that you should honor him as God. And unfortunately, I don't have time yet to prove it. So one more round and then conclusions and then we'll stop. The Bible, if you study the Bible, most of the time, if not every time, the Bible talks of the Holy Spirit. It talks about the fellowship and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Why do you think that is? Christians, once they're born again by the Holy Spirit, then they have, they, 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 it's like they're connected, plugged in to one another through this invisible power. So the Holy Spirit, when the Bible talks about it, about him or he, it, it, it's actually it. In the Greek, I think, if we study in the Greek, we'll find it is an it. All right. It, it has to do with our fellowship. I, I have a house in Romania. I went to Romania as a missionary, and I learned a lot of things. But about, uh, about uh, 25 miles from our house, there's a huge lake there, and uh, there's huge generators there. And they generate tremendous amount of voltage from these huge generators. That's the source. But I live 25 miles away. How do I, how do I connect with that source, with the electric lines? That would be the peril, that's parallel to the Holy Spirit. God is the source, source of all life, the one being God, the Lord our God is one Lord, but I'm down here, that's why Jesus said you must be born again. When we're born again, then we receive life in our spirit, and our spirit communicates with God's spirit. Those are the electric lines that connect us. That's why we're never called, uh, the Bible never calls us to worship the Holy Spirit. Why not? If he's a divine person, like this man claims, why not? In the end times, just as a warning, the Bible talks about the, 
the, uh, the whole world will be worshiping Satan, how does Satan going to, how is he going to pull that off in the Christian world? I will tell you, and it's a warning to you, when Christians lift up their hands like this and say, oh, come Holy Spirit, we worship you, what would be wrong with that if he's not a, a person? That is, a, if through their doctrine, through the man's doctrine that he holds, they have fabricated this third person, actually, that does not exist as a person. The Holy Spirit is not to be worshipped. So when Christians do that, they are, they are actually in idol worship. They're worshiping God that they have fabricated by their own theology. That's why the Holy Spirit is not to be worshipped. How many in the God, uh, the God is, is the, the God, the head of Jesus, Christ. Christ is the head of man and then man the head of the woman. Where is the Holy Spirit in all this? It doesn't exist in, the, in this headship order. If he would be a, a person, divine person, as this man claims, then where is, where is, he, where is he in the headship order? That's, that should be a red flag. Stop. Time. So we're going to do what? This is my second round, and then we're going to do conclusions. So ladies, no, 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 this is not. We're going to do one round of conclusions after this. This is my reply, and then conclusions. So in other words, I'm doing three minutes, then he's doing three minutes, then I'm doing three minutes. Right, ladies and gentlemen, please know this brother is totally out of his depth. Have you yet heard any reply to my arguments about the Holy Spirit? No. No. And this is the danger of pride and ignorance going together. And I want to encourage this brother to have a little more humility and maybe pick up his Bible and go back into the shallow end of theology and start again. Because... He's out of his depth and he hasn't addressed any of the points that I've made. And so now I'm just going to conclude by pointing out that Jesus calls himself God. Here's where Jesus calls himself God. In Mark chapter 1, verses 23 onwards, it says, And it happened that he was passing through the grain fields of the, on, on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Luke, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to accept, eat except the priest. And he also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was not made man the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath so the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath Amen. Amen. who is the Lord of the Sabbath except God exactly. whose day is it it's God's day yes. according to the Old Testament that you shall have a Sabbath unto Yahweh as it says in Exodus and Deuteronomy if Jesus is referring to the Sabbath day as being his day he's calling himself God in Matthew 11, verses 7 to 11, and for time, I don't have time to read it, but Jesus, speaking of John the Baptist, applies the prophecy of Malachi to John the Baptist, saying, For this is he whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. By Jesus applying the prophecy of Malachi to John the Baptist, when Malachi says that I will send a messenger before my face and that the angel of the, 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 the angel of the covenant whom you rejoice in shall visit the temple by applying that to John the Baptist, he makes John the Baptist the prophesied messenger of Yahweh. But if John the Baptist is the prophesied messenger of Yahweh, then who is Jesus? Yahweh. According to Jesus' teaching, he is Yahweh. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Amen. I encourage you all to read it. So now we're going to do conclusions. Here's his last three minutes to try and address any point that I made at all. At least one. The reason I don't address his uh, garbage is Whoa. because the truth, the truth will set you free. When you know the truth, then he automatically, you can't believe this uh, hogwash that he's saying. Jesus was described by Peter. He says, listen to this. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. Not Jesus uh, as a being coming down from heaven. Not part of God. No. 
Jesus a man. Listen what Peter says. A man, not only just a man, but a man approved of God by signs and wonders which God, the one true God of heaven and earth, did through the man. Furthermore, Jesus is a, the, was the first man, because only a man needs the anointing of God. The Holy Spirit anoints us, empowers us to live a godly life unto our God, Creator God. That's why Jesus was the Messiah or, or the Christ. He was the first man. Now he has many brothers and I am one of them. Many brothers who are also anointed. And I know God, Jesus Christ, by the same anointing that I have. The same anointing that was on Christ Jesus gives me the wisdom and knowledge to know and understand Jesus. So Jesus is a man, total contrary to what these fellows have of Jesus. Furthermore, then when Jesus was was there ready to be crucified, here we see that Jesus indeed was a man. He had the will of a man. And that so uh, Jesus said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. There we see the will of a man. Yes, it was a man difficult to go to the cross. But then Jesus as the man, Pilate said, behold the man. He recognized Jesus as a man. All right. So there we see that the will of man coming against, to use the word against, but it's not really proper because Jesus then submitted his human will to the will of the Heavenly Father. So there we see a human will. And that could be, my message to you is that could be possible uh, for, for you and I. We have to submit our will, our will to God the Father and Jesus Christ is our perfect example. 30 seconds. So the example of their kind of Jesus destroys the pattern that Jesus is for all humanity. Jesus, Jesus, furthermore, Jesus said, he that overcome, he that overcome us as I overcame. Jesus did not have any, any intrinsic uh, God, uh, you know, the nature somehow of God in him, no. Jesus overcame by the same power that you and I must overcome, namely, the power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Time. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Right, ladies and gentlemen. So I just want to point out something that in his last three minutes, he didn't bother to address any argument I raised. <laughs> However, I will give him, him the courtesy that he refuses to give to me by addressing his final argument. Put your hand up if you believe that Jesus Christ was fully human. Duh! So just pointing out what we believe doesn't disprove what we believe. Pointing out that Jesus Christ had a fully human will doesn't disprove what Christians believe. Because Christians believe that Christ was fully human. So therefore pointing that out to us is no argument at all. But the question is, is Christ just a human? And the brother was right. He stumbled on an orthodox position. Christ was submitting his human will to the divine will because the human will is to run from pain and death and Christ is overcoming that fear. It's instinctive will that Christ is submitting to the divine will, ladies and gentlemen. And the divine will is shared by Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Imagine for a second that all of you listening, that my mind was your mind, that my will was your will and I decided Right, I'm going to do a litter sweep. What are you all going to do? You're all going to start picking up the litter. Why? Because your will is my will and my mind is your mind. And so the Son accomplishes the will of the Father. The will that the Son has is one with the Father. And he is submitting the human will to the divine will. And the will of the Son, the, div the role of the Son within the economy of the Trinity is always to do the will of the Father. Always. And that's what we're seeing in Scripture. So, pointing out that Jesus is a man accredited by God the Father is what we believe. That doesn't disprove what we believe. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the danger of ignorance when he's combined with pride. This brother in humanity has picked up the Bible and decided that he can start from year zero and rewrite all theology because he is the great man of God. And look where it has got him. 
He is on the path to hell and destruction. 30 seconds. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have demonstrated that his arguments do not destroy the Trinity and that the scriptures show that Jesus is God and that the Holy Spirit is a person who he already accepted was divine. So he is a divine person and in all of this debate he squandered it without any opportunity, without any attempt to reply to the arguments. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you lose a debate. And so I encourage him to come to the faith. Anyway, brother, that's it, we're done. Look, I have no hard feelings to you at all. And so, good, I'm glad. And so what I would like to do is to offer you an academic gospel. So this is a gospel where they break down the words of scripture and then they give you actual academic words and commentary on those scriptures because I want to help you to find the fullness of the truth. And so this is right up your street. It's a gospel and it's full of academic commentary we'll it, on the gospel. We'll this is for it, we'll you. No, I, I don't need that. Right. He doesn't need it. That says everything you need to. It didn't help you. that kind of lies. They, there we go. They, Ladies and gentlemen, this deal, sir, bro, when, sir, when wait, wait, sir, the conversation, the debate's over. Hey, that's all, that's I just okay. wanted, to, I just it's wanted a, to offer a you a gift. World. I can talk. Right. You want to So, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> any Q and A, any questions that you want to ask? <laughs> can I have that? Uh, I have some questions for you. Are you a, are you a Christian? I'd like to ask you a question. Hey, what? Question and answer now between you and I. Oh, okay. Questions. This should be good. <laughs> He's agreed to answer my questions. Right. I'll do that. Tell, tell, tell everybody. Okay, okay. Go on. Who died on the cross? We'll do question for question. question, for question. Yeah. Right. So, tell me. wait. Who died on the cross? The right. The question was, yeah. who died on the cross? Yeah. Jesus Christ. Now my question. <laughs> If the Holy Spirit, I no, one, one second, no, one I second. Follow up on Don't inter I didn't interrupt you. She, the Holy Spirit is described as an intercessor. My question is this: Who is the inter? What is intercession? You, uh, you're not speaking correctly. There's Holy Spirit is not an intercessor. Jesus Christ intercedes for us. Uh huh. He didn't answer. Show me in the scripture where the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. He's asked a question. Thank you. He's asked the question. So I'll answer the question. You asked the question, where in scripture is the Holy Spirit described as an intercessor? So, get your Bible. Come with me to Romans chapter 8. Listen. Right? Romans chapter 8, verse 26. In the same way the Spirit also helps our weaknesses for we do not know how to pray as we should but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words so now i'm going no i'm going to i am going to ask you a question no, you, i'm going you to a, ask you, you a question you asked a question you i'm going to ask you a question now. now that i have shown you where the Holy Spirit is described as an intercessor, I ask you again, listen guys, I ask you again, what is an intercessor? What is an intercessor? That's the question, yes. All right, Jesus said, behold, I am with you even into the end of the world. Is Jesus personally here with me? I take comfort in that. But how is that done? Because he's a life-giving spirit. Where the, where the Spirit of the Lord is there, I, look, uh, in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians, it says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Yes, the Spirit, Jesus is now in Spirit, and He intercedes for us through the Holy Spirit, comforts us. Jesus is not here in person with us. No, He's still in heaven. He will one day in bodily form come. Now it's the Spirit that intercedes, but behind that power is the Holy Spirit. It, uh, excuse me, is Jesus Christ Himself? Yeah. So, so He says that because He's made a person out of the Holy Spirit, as though the Holy Spirit is a person. So this person of the Holy Spirit intercedes. This third person, in that sense, I deny what, what, what's that. What's your question? Deny. 
Jesus Christ himself intercedes for us at the right hand of God. Okay. He's the only mediator. Right. Between Guys, God he's, and he's not, he's not so answering the sense, question. I, I said, I deny what is an intercessor? In that sense, what is an intercessor? Well, I, well, I, I just. Uh, what is an intercessor? A go between. What? Go on. Tell me more. Tell me more. There's one man. No. What is an intercessor? One mediator between God and men. What is an intercessor? An intercessor could be like a, like a. Uh, what's the name they use here in England? Uh, and we say an attorney. And uh, you say a uh, solicitor. Right. All right. Okay. Do you want to ask a question? Between... Now you've answered my question. Okay. Do you want to ask All a right. question? So, so that's not a. That's not. Do you want a, to ask a question? A person. Do you Jesus want to ask Christ a question? Jesus Christ intercedes between me and God the Father because you've made a, a person out of the Holy Spirit. That's why. I Have you said got a no, question? It's not the Holy Spirit. Have you got a question? Jesus Christ. Have you got a question? You've got a question. No. Have you got a question? Yes. Go on. All right. When if God, if Jesus is God, you answer it from this point of view now. Your point of view. If Jesus Christ is God, as you claim 100% God, then what died on the cross? Okay, so the question is, the question is a fair one, and it's one that it's important for Christians to understand. In Scripture, the refrain in Romans and in the writings of Peter is that Christ died in the flesh. The teaching of the Council of Ephesus is that the immortal cannot die. So what died on the cross? The humanity of Jesus. Who died on the cross? Jesus Christ, the eternal word of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity. The second person of the Holy Trinity died in his humanity, experienced death, humanity, ladies and gentlemen. So that is what died on the cross, the humanity of Jesus. And who died on the cross? The second person of the Trinity, the eternal word of God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask the question, because he, uh, he said, one, one thing that he said was that Peter called Jesus a man. So I want him to answer this question. This is Peter's writings. In 2 Peter 3, it says this, Simon Peter, a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So my question is a really simple one. Who is being identified as God by Peter in that passage? Let me address that. The man here apparently is not using his noodles. He doesn't uh, take in consideration that God, the word God, is a title. That's why when it talks about the creator of the universe, it, uh, it usually addressed God the Father. Paul, it's very clear. Paul the Apostle says, although there be gods many and lords many, see God, many, many beings that claim even Satan himself is a type of God. So God is a title. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. God is a title. So, so who on. was it given to go in that verse? Now with the, the, the quote. Paul the Apostle Who says, was it given to in that verse? Although there be gods many and lords That's many. That's not the question. us. There is but one God. That's Unitarian, not the one, question. One the question is who's identified as God word. in 1 Peter. Wait a minute. Answer I, the question. With, I, I was talking. It's you, like pulling teeth. You know I, I was talking. Do you want to hear him answer so, the actual question so, I asked? So he says, yes. in one Lord, Jesus Christ. How did he become Lord? Who? No, right. Peter, Peter guys, that. he's just this using Jesus this as an opportunity to preach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So God at this point, guys, I'm just going to bring this to an end. Yeah. Because the brother is out of his depth, he is, he is, right? right? And honestly, bro, I think you need to go away back to scripture. If you want, I'll gladly meet with you outside of the park and talk with you more um, if you want to do that. But, but this conversation is getting nowhere if you can't answer questions. And you can't answer questions because you're not educated enough on scripture. So uh, my advice is meet up with me and let me help you. Let me teach you. 
I say the Let same to you. you. Great, good, we'll meet. Fantastic, we'll meet. Good. I want you to educate me, get in touch. Get in touch, Let, educate me. There we go, we're gonna meet outside the park. Right, guys, I'm here until six. So I've got a few minutes, I probably can do one question. Go on. What's the question, bro? No, let me, let me, re, let me do questions. Question. One quick question before I go. Go and talk to him, bro. Go on, bro. Right, so the question is, I mentioned the Nissing Creed. Do I adopt the Filioque? No, I don't. Why do I not adopt the Filioque? Is it because theologically it's some kind of problem? No, it isn't. However, it's not canonical. It's not canonical because the Ecumenical Council of Constantinople, sorry, of Nicaea, is what gave us the Nicene Creed. There was no Ecumenical Council for the Filioque. So whilst theologically it presents zero problems, no matter what any radical extremist orthodox brother what brother wants us to say but in reality there's no canonical justification you can't outstrip an ecumenical council with a non-ecumenical council and the adoption of the filioque was by local synods not by an ecumenical council and so simply for canonical reasons i don't use the filioque okay I am now going to go and collect some people and go for a drink. Anybody who wants to join me can do so. Just stay here while I find the brother who I'm meant to be going with. Well done, both.